I can remember well, back in Bible college days, and you'd have chapel, and speakers would come in, and, you know, they'd pump you up, you know, go build the church, go do the work of the Lord, go do all this, and, and they'd get you all, you know, somebody would come in and build a big church and get you all psyched up. And been thinking about it years later, sometimes it's almost like a sales pitch, because my dad was a salesman. And I can remember Amway presentation, Herbalife presentation, various insurance companies. In fact, I had my insurance license one time in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, and me and my sister used to go and service some of his uh, accounts for disability insurance. And so I've, I've done the whole thing. And, and the dirty little secret with all of these, whether it's go build a church, whether it's go sell Amway, there's one element that they, they fail to really teach you and emphasize is in all of these things, you have to deal with people, right? Like preachers joke, church would be good if it wasn't for the people, right? But then... We wouldn't have church if there wasn't people, right? So, so it's kind of a catch-22, but, but then you would hear later sometimes these stories of these big explosions, and you'd hear later that uh, there was a split or this or that happened. And, and I think one of the emphasis that sometimes we fail in the church is to teach people the value of Strong, healthy relationships. And the importance of those relationships. Now, all of us, I'm sure, have been disappointed by relationships. I, I guess I ought to ask, if is there anybody here who has never been disappointed, right? Rather than show of hands of the people that have been discouraged, disappointed, let down, betrayed, misunderstood. I can remember when I was young. I had my first experience with that. I was uh, sleeping over a friend's house and, and said something in private to him. And the next week at school, it was public. And so you learn at a, I think sometimes you learn at a young age to put the wall up. Right? We learn to put the wall up. We learn to be guarded. And we, we joke in our society about being a hermit going away somewhere. I read a book a while ago about a hermit in Maine. He was almost 20, over 20 years living in the woods. They didn't even, he would go and the, uh, the houses on the lake would always have stuff stolen. They never could find him. And he withdrew from society. But the, but the problem with that is it's not healthy. Jesus said, John chapter 13, verse 34, he says, a new commandment I give you. And notice what he says, that you what? Love one another. And notice what he says, as I love one as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So Jesus put this emphasis on the importance of relationships. And if you think about Jesus, he spent a good amount of time building a relationship with his disciples. And so he told us, as I have loved you. You. So I want to say this morning that there is hope for relationships. Even if we've been disappointed, even if we've been misunderstood, even if we've had people do bad things for us, or maybe we haven't, maybe we grew up in an atmosphere that we didn't learn to have healthy relationships. There's no, there, there aren't any classes at public school how to have healthy relationships, Right? And they weren't at Bible college either. 
And I think it would have been valuable. Because in every area of our lives, whether it's marriage, whether it's work, whether it's church, whether it's school, wherever there are people, we have to learn to deal with relationships. Good and bad, right? We have to deal with them. And so Jesus is saying, as I have loved you, he's saying, I'm going to give you an example of a friendship. I'm going to give you an example of love. I'm going to give you an example that will empower you to be able to be a good friend and have good friendships. And especially, especially in the church. And sometimes the church hasn't been good about this. Sometimes in the church we're more worried about being right than a relationship. I grew up in a church like this, or was in a church like this, that if you didn't, if you didn't stay on the party line, that's it. We're not talking to you anymore. We're, we're unfriending you. On, well, there wasn't Facebook back then, back then, but so you can understand in today's language. It was, and you would see people that had left the church and you wouldn't talk to them. And, and I'm thinking, is that what Jesus wants? That we can have so little value with relationships that if we disagree on something that's minor, that's an opinion, that's it, we're cutting each other off. By the way, that's what our culture is coming to, isn't it? And we are dividing over opinions. And so Jesus is saying, as I loved you, I'm going to give an example of friendship, and I want you guys here. Listen, my, my goal for you to d- disciples is to develop a strong relationship. Uh, Jesus said in this passage, by this people will know you're my disciples. Listen, people don't, people want to see genuine love and relationships. And by the way, it's not perfect. Okay? Love doesn't mean perfection. Otherwise, I wouldn't still be married. Every wife has a, a special gift of grace to put up with their ignorant husbands. And you would think after so many years I would start learning some of these lessons. But Jesus said, as I've loved you, think about how, listen, think about how Jesus loves you. Think about how much stuff Jesus puts up with you. And he still has his hand out. His grace is still there. He's still seeking you. So he's given us this hope that we can have these genuine relationships in our lives and especially in the church. And that means sometimes working through difficult situations and not giving up. Somebody said today, that people are lucky today because of the various circumstances with people moving, with how rapid our society is, that people are lucky if they have one close friend in their lifetime. Webster said a friend is a person on the same side in a struggle, one who is not an enemy or foe, but an ally. A British uh, publication offered a prize for the best definition of friendship. One was one who multiplies joy, divides griefs, and whose honesty is unbreakable. One said, one who understands our silence, a volume of sympathy bound in cloth. Another one said... Someone said, uh, 
a watch that beats all time and never runs down. And the winning one was a friend is the one who comes in when the whole world has gone out. One that comes in when the whole world has gone out. And that's a good thought of a definition. And here we come in this passage in Samuel, and Deliah, uh, excuse me, David just slew the giant. So his celebrity status is going to go through the roof. Okay? And we know David today because of this slaying of Goliath. And David, probably in his mind, remember, he was anointed what? To be who? King, right? He was already anointed. Saul knew this. But Saul is not going to accept this. And David's life, he's probably thinking that, all right, it's going to be smooth sailing from now on. And he's going to have 10 years of hardship, struggle. He's going to live in a cave. Just when he thought everything was going to go nice and smooth, all the bumps are going to come. We're going to see those in the next few weeks. That David's ascent to the throne is going to be a lot more bumpy and rocky than he anticipated. And so, first Sam, we come to first Sam. The first thing we have is Jonathan coming to David. And they become good friends. They become soulmates. Jonathan becomes an encouragement, a rock to David. Remember, we had a message on Jonathan's faith a few weeks or a couple months ago uh, here in Samuel. But Jonathan, interesting thing that Jonathan was Saul's son. So Jonathan's older than David. Jonathan's watching everything that's happened. And Jonathan, we saw his faith. We understand he has a love for God. Yet his dad is in the process of tumbling down the hill. He's going to go from ambivalence to hatred. And finally, death as Saul starts going totally off the wall. And Jonathan's there. Remember, he's the heir to the throne. But the throne that is already given over to David. And so Jonathan comes to David and their hearts become united. They become knit. They become one. God gives to David a friend. God gives to David, and I think this was what David needed. Listen to me. Don't say you don't need friends. Okay? Don't say you don't need friends. Don't say you don't need anybody. You say that when you're hurt or you've been disappointed. But don't say you don't need friends. And I understand good friends are hard to come by sometimes. But sometimes it's even harder to be that friend. See, we always look at it from how people treat us instead of thinking of it, have we invested in others? How do we do this? Through the grace of God, as we will see. Because Jesus said, as I have loved you. So we see Jonathan here, and we see four characteristics of a true friend. First of all, a true friend is not jealous. It's not jealous. Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Now, Jonathan very easily could have felt threatened by David. Right? He could have felt threatened by David. He could have felt threatened that David, here's David, look at, he's getting all the praise, and we're going to talk about jealousy next week from Saul. But David could have been very 
I mean, Jonathan had been very envious, jealous of David, yet he saw David's love for God. And he saw his heart. And Jonathan came to David and came to him and saw his, and they, their hearts were united. The Bible says this in Romans twelve fifteen: Rejo- Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. So when your friend gets a new job or promotion, what do we do? We celebrate with them. We rejoice with them. We don't say, that should have been me. He's an idiot. I'm much smarter than him. How did he get promoted? Now, I know you guys are spurts. You've never thought things like that, right? You guys never had those thoughts. That's the heart, right? Our heart is very selfish, very jealous, very thinking of ourselves, but Jonathan was not jealous. Jonathan didn't have any Jonathan didn't have any guile, he didn't have any pretension, he didn't have any uh, he understood, you know what he understood? He understood, listen to me, he understood the sovereignty of God and that God is in control of all things. And that how our life goes, it may not go the way we want it to go, but it goes the way God wants it to go. We're not all gifted as others. We all have different gifts. We all have different talents. And so we need to encourage, love, Rejoice with each other, love each other, cry with each other. That's what Jonathan did. He came to David. And then we see true friendship. A true friend helps you to grow close to God. A true friend helps you to grow close to God. And our friendships in the church... They're not based on you all liking the Red Sox and the Patriots. Especially in Connecticut, because Connecticut is a, you know, a mixed multitude to New England, but a lot of you guys are like wrong. <laughs> You've been deceived. I grew up in, born in Boston, grew up in Maine. They, they, I never, anyways, well, let me not get there. But that's not our fellowship. I'll still love you even if you like the Yankees. And I'll pray for you. God will give you the wisdom and understanding. But uh, that's not the basis of our friendship. That's not the basis. Our base, we want to grow close to God, all of us. And if you look in the New Testament, they were more powerful when they were united. We can't do the work of God alone. You, listen, you can be the best quarterback. But if your offensive line stinks, right? You need everybody. And so we need all of us. And so part of our, listen, part of our work in the church is not just do, it's grow together right we do oftentimes we do things as a church but the underlying goal is that should unite us together i think my wife said we had over 20 volunteers helping out with the parade everybody doing a little part growing together working together it helps us to grow but it is also should we should also encourage each other to get close to god listen somebody that wants to get you away from god is not a true friend Somebody that discourages you from church and reading the Bible and getting close to God is not a true friend. They're an enemy. We should be encouraging, helping each other. The Bible says in Colossians uh, chapter 2 that their hearts may be encouraged. Notice what it says. Being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God 
both of the Father and of Christ, Colossians 2.2. 2. Notice what he says, that their hearts, and he's talking about our relationship with God. But you learn more about God together. You learn more about God together. Because you need God more together. As we deal with each other and have patience with each other. You can go on an island and be by yourself, but that's, no, that's not spirituality. Spirituality is dealing in the real world. Dealing with people. Dealing with your family, dealing with your friends, dealing with work, dealing in the church. And he says that you, you may be encouraged that you grow together, that the riches of the full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and the Christ. And so notice, and he talks about this in Ephesians chapter 3, but notice that our understanding and knowledge of God comes as we grow together. So a true friend helps you to grow close to God. And then we see a true friend is loyal. True friend is loyal. Loyalty is this faithfulness, faithful to a prince or superior. True to the plighted faith, duty or love. Not treacherous. Used of subjects to the princes and of husband and wife and lovers as loyal subject, a loyal wife. So Jonathan took his belt and his tunic and his sword and his bow and his belt and he gave these to David as the sign of his loyalty, of a sign of his trust in David. Now there's not a lot of loyalty today. And because of our sometimes we have a consumer based society, right? How many of you in the past year have gone back and complained about something at the store or this? It wasn't right, this product wasn't right, it was broken, this or that. Well, all of us today, we get defects. All of us today, we're broken. All of us today are not what we should be. And so if we judge each other on perfection, on consumerism, on materialism, we're going to have, we're going to say, I'm done with him. I'm done with her. That's not loyalty. Loyalty is, I'm not giving up with on them. No matter how much they hurt me. No, how much they forgot about me. No, how much they didn't call me back. They didn't like my picture. You don't know the context. You don't know what's going on behind the scenes. And oftentimes when we assume about somebody it's wrong and we get upset, but maybe they had a car accident, maybe something... They got sick. Maybe something happened. And we have this quick temper and I'm going to give up. Not dealing with it. That's not loyalty. Jonathan is committing his loyalty to David. And David's going to need this. And Jonathan's going to keep his word in spite of the personal loss to him. In spite of the fact that he's going to go against his father, Jonathan is a true, loyal friend. Loyalty. Jo Jonathan had no malice. He wasn't two-faced. He didn't have any ulterior motives. He was not manipulating. He was not distrustful. He was not selfish. He said, I'm going to be loyal to my friend loyalty is a lost 
characteristic today. We don't, we're very, very much change our loyalties easily. But in the church, we need to be loyal to each other. We need to stick up for each other, pray for each other, work with each other, love each other. In our families, in our marriages, we need to be loyal. And a true friend helps when we are in need. So remember, David's a young boy. He's a shepherd's boy. He didn't have a sword. He didn't have a tunic. He didn't have a bow. He didn't have a robe. Jonathan came and gave these to David because he was in need. Jonathan sealed the pack by taking off his robe and giving it to David together with his tunic, sword, bow, and belt. And Jonathan made a solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. A true, listen, a true friend is never inconvenient. Inconvenienced. A true friend is willing to be there at any time. I remember one time I was driving, we were driving down, I don't know who was with me, I was driving down 495. And my gas tank was here and it started going, I was watching it go down. Like that. Obviously, it was a leak. So I pulled off the road. And I was in, I think I was in Lowell or, hey, or Lawrence somewhere in there. And a pastor friend of mine, Dr., uh, Don Perkins, was a pastor in Haverhill. And called him. He said, I'll be, be right there. Came right there. And uh, picked us up. And brought us home and asleep in his home that night. Next day we went and fixed the car. The ga- I forget what it was. I had to change I don't remember change a gas tank or something. But he was there. Somebody I could call at any time. A true friend is one that doesn't say, oh, well, you know what? Yeah, I was going to go to sleep. I really can't help you. Or, uh, you know, I do it, but, you know, it's the first episode of Walking Dead for the season, and I just, I can't miss it. And uh, a true friend's ready to help at any time. A true friend's there. And, and Jonathan was there for David. He was there to help David. And so as we think about these characteristics of a true friendship, those are what we need to be. And I am reminded in studying and thinking about these things, how short I fall on these things. And been reminded that it's not about people being a friend to me. It's about me being a friend to them. And the final point this morning is Jesus is a true friend. See, Jesus fulfills all these requirements. David was a, think about this, David was a type of Christ. Jonathan was Saul's son. Saul was a type of Adam. And here's Jonathan, and he's submitting himself and giving his heart, really. They become knit together. He was giving his heart to David. And I think that's the hesitation we have in friendships, right? We are hesitant. We are afraid to give our whole heart to somebody. I think it, this affects women more. Because women, when they start friendships, they're all in. Men, we've got a hand like this. We're like, mm, well, we'll see this dude, how he is. Right? We're a little more reserved. We're not like all jumping in. You know, men, you know, I have friends, you know, I haven't seen in six months, a year. Get together was like we saw each other yesterday. How you doing, man? Good. Whatever. 
Woman, you know, they didn't like my picture yesterday. Something's going on. And there are those differences, and I understand. But listen to me. We listen. I, I, I tell my wife all this time. I love people through Christ. We need to give our heart first of all to Jesus. He's the one we can trust with our heart. He's the true friend that sticks closer than the brother. He's the true friend that never leaves us. And Jesus said to his disciples, "You are my friends." Think about this. Think about Christianity doesn't offer duty. It offers friendship. It offers friendship. Jesus said, I'm your friend. You want a true close friend? You can have a true close friend. Jesus. And if if you make Jesus your closest friend, Friends, he will enable you to have friendships with other people. Sometimes we don't know how to deal with our relationships. Sometimes we we follow what we've grown up with, we follow what other people do, we follow the negativity and the lack of loyalty of our society and culture. But the closer and deeper we get to Jesus, the closer and deeper we can have a relationship in our marriage, in our church, with our friends, with our family. Jesus said, you're my friends if you do whatever I command you. He's offering us this morning true, genuine, perfect. He's Listen, he's the only perfect friend. And as good of as a friend I might think I am, I'm often been reminded of how I've disappointed people. So Jesus is the true friend. This week, somebody from our home church in Rhode Island had a funeral, 41 years old committed suicide and I've heard several people this week that have committed suicide this week and I'm thinking they probably didn't have a friend they probably just needed somebody to talk to there are opportunities for us to be friends all around you don't know what people are going through we need to be there for them. Joseph Scriven was born 1819 in Ireland. He went to Trinity College, got his bachelor's degree. He was known as a poet, was engaged to be married, and just before his wedding, his fiance drowned as he was helplessly on the other side of the river. Being discouraged, he left England. At the age of 25, traveled to Port Hope, Canada. And again, he met another young woman, Elisa Roach. They fell in love. He was excited, had plans to get married. And shortly before their wedding, she died of a pneumonia. Joseph began serving other people. He would be noticed in the community. He would go and cut wood for people. He would give the clothes off his back. And he would serve the poor people in the community daily without any pay. He would refuse. He would find a poor family, help them, give them what he had. And he became known in the community for somebody that did all these good works. And one day, one of his friends was visiting him as he lay in his bed dying. And he noticed a bunch of poetry, and Joseph showed him some of 
the poetry that he had. And one of them was a letter that he had, a poem he had written to his mother. His mother was in Ireland. And, of course, back then there weren't airplanes. It was very difficult to, to go and visit people. Often when you left your home, you never went back. You never saw them again. And she was discouraged. Her husband had died. She was ill. And he wrote a poem that many of you know. It's a hymn. All of you probably know what a friend we have in Jesus. And the person asked, who wrote this hymn? He said, well, it was a letter from my mom. And me and the Lord wrote it together. As a result of all the suffering he went through. And after he died, the city of Port Hope erected this monument. It's actually a newer one. There was an old, there is an older one too, but they re- erected this monument to the life of, of Joseph Scriven because of all the works and his compassion and how he tirelessly served others. And he wrote this hymn. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace would we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. I was going to sing that for you this morning, but I asked my daughter to sing it. I thought it would be much more appropriate. But let's stand this morning. And as a verse of invitation, I'm inviting you this morning to have a friendship with Jesus. I'm inviting you to make Jesus your friend. I'm inviting you that even if you're disappointed, even if you've been hurt, even if you've been run over, even if you're, you're hesitant, you have this wall, put that wall down and give your heart to Jesus. He wants to be your friend. Maybe you just need to come to him and confess him as your Savior. You're not sure if you're saved. The Bible says, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Maybe this morning you're hurting. Maybe you haven't had the close friendships. Or maybe this morning you're like me and think, you know what? I need to be a better friend. I need to not be worried about the bottom line. Like I, I told you, the, the illustration at the beginning was... It was we get all pumped out about the ministry. The ministry is people, so God wants us to love people. So it's not all the great works you do, it's the people you love. Maybe God just wants it. Maybe maybe in your marriage relationship, your marriage relationship, your partner should be your best friend. My wife is my best friend. It starts with a friendship should be a friendship relationship maybe you need to get back to that you know how you do it first uh, first thing you do make jesus your friend heavenly father we thank you for your goodness we thank you for all that you've done lord we thank you that you're our friend we thank you that we you love us that you're there for us lord you've offered us friendship lord you haven't offered us just duty just rules You said, you're my friends. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You come as we sing this morning.